Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, The Populist Dialogues. Our program promotes progressive populist perspectives on the issues of the day. The Alliance for Democracy is dedicated to ending corporate domination and creating a just society based on an equitable, sustainable economy. Our guest today is Steve Weiss, president of the Oregon Consumer League, as well as president of the Oregon State Council for Retired Citizens. So welcome to the show, Steve. Thank you, David. Yeah. So uh, I met you just uh, um, just uh, maybe six weeks ago. Uh, we were walking a picket line. Yes. Where, where was the picket line and why were we walking it? Well, we were walking it because CenturyLink is doing stuff that is not good. <laughs> and so the Oregon Consumer League decided to have an action outside uh, CenturyLink's headquarters. Mm -hmm. um, the action was, from my point of view, very successful. Um, KGW came out, yes. we got a nice news story mm -hmm. on it, and um, it's just too many companies like CenturyLink are uh, gouging customers, and the Oregon Consumer League wants to do something about that, and so I was very happy to be part of that. Uh, yeah, and I, I was very happy to be part of it. Uh, of course, you and I first met on, on Facebook, I'm, I, yes. I probably... Uh, in conjunction with the Oregon Consumer League as well, so yes. I felt like I knew you before I met you. And I heard about <laughs> you even before that, so. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, so um, why did Oregon Consumer League specifically target or, or, or focus on CenturyLink? I think communications companies like CenturyLink and Comcast, which we've already, we've also done some stuff on, are uh, targeted because they're not doing what they should be doing. They're not serving consumers effectively. People are paying much too much money for services. And uh, when organizations like those two uh, do something like that, uh, the Oregon Consumer League wants to get involved in order to level the playing field for those who are getting their services through Mm -hmm. companies like that and so I, I think that's what the OCL is really about uh -huh. yeah 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 and, and I, I think one of the one of the issues with Comcast and CenturyLink is is this whole question about customer service of of being promised one rate and then finding your bill as a different rate and then having to go call them and then having a discussion and I can tell you this because I've done this yes. <laughs> and then agreeing on, on yet another rate and a different package of services pro probably, and then getting yet another bill. In my case, uh, the second bill was even higher than the first bill. And uh, so I called the complaint again, and, and so th then they, they told me, oh no, we couldn't possibly have told you that. Well, I had my notes. Now, we couldn't possibly have told you that because you've run out of credits, whatever credit is. I don't care about your credits. I want to know what the, what the price is and what I'm going to get. So anyway, we finally did uh, resolve that. So, but, but I noticed that now, and I don't know if this is a question of taxes or fees or what, but every month it creeps up like another 50 cents. <laughs> really irritating, but not worth calling them for another hour on the phone. So. Right. Right, yeah. So anyway, uh, talk a little bit about the Oregon Consumer League history. I recall maybe 30 years ago about hearing of all the Oregon Consumer League, not hearing anything from them or about them until just very recently. Well, the Oregon Consumer League in 2017 is celebrating its 50th anniversary. Oh, okay. It's been around a very long time through different incarnations. Um, a few years ago, the OCL had become somewhat moribund. And a group of folks, including yours truly, um, became members of the board with the idea of reviving the Oregon Consumer League and ultimately making it the most important consumer organization in Oregon. Mm -hmm. I think we're well on our way to doing that. Um, we only have six board members now, but four of them are attorneys who are involved in various aspects of consumer law. Mm -hmm. And we, we will broaden our board uh, with representatives from other areas of the community. Um, and so we hope in the next two years to actually become a really important partner 
um, in consumer affairs in the state. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when you say consumer affairs, what, what does that entail? It entails a lot of stuff. Um, consumer issues uh, involve housing and health care and privacy and a number of other issues. Um, uh, I, I'm giving three issues that are very important now. Mm -hmm. um, uh, healthcare and housing in particular, given the attacks on both of those by the Trump administration nationally, and also given uh, Representative Julie Parrish's bill, which was recently introduced, which threatens Medicaid recipients here in Oregon. Mm -hmm. And so the Oregon Consumer League recently became uh, recently went from a 501c3 nonprofit to a 501c4 nonprofit, and C4s can endorse political candidates. Right. Mm -hmm. We are readying ourselves mm -hmm. for the 2018 elections, and we hope to be a major player in the politics of this state. We'll certainly be the only consumer organization uh -huh. that endorses political candidates. Oh, okay. So that'll be new. Y yeah. So uh, other consumer organizations in Oregon, names? The only one that I know of is Osberg, really. Y yeah, and that's the only one I, that comes to my mind also. And Osberg is part of a nationwide group of PERGs, um, public interest research groups. Mm -hmm. And so I've been uh, 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 getting Osberg stuff through my, through my computer for a long time. But beyond those two organizations, David, I can't think of another one um, in Oregon. And so there needs to be one main consumer organization, and we want it to be us. Okay, uh, yeah, well, you, you um, uh, have a strong possibility, I think, of, of, of doing that. And you know, it, it's, uh, of course, the question, how do you get your name out? How do you publicize? Well, I can tell you one way we did it. Okay. We went. We uh, formed a partnership with Our Oregon. Okay. And I've been involved with Our Oregon a long time through the Oregon State Council for Retired Citizens, mm -hmm. and um, we were very much involved in Our Oregon's efforts um, uh, to do any to to do a number of things within the last year or so. In particular, David passing Measure 97. Okay. And we were very involved, and our, our Oregon was the, the main organization. Yes, right, oh, right, yeah. um, which was the corporate tax. It, it, yes, oh. yes, we didn't make it. No. Right. And we were all disappointed by that. You, you were fantastically outspent at that. Yes, we <laughs> were. But our Oregon is still doing stuff to try to get what we wanted uh, through different areas, possibly mm -hmm. Um, through the state legislature, uh, possibly in other ways. And we still have uh, that partnership with our Oregon. It's informal now. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I got to meet Ben Unger, and yeah. uh, I knew Ben from, uh, you know, from the legislature. Sure. Uh -huh. And I really like the folks at our Oregon and like what they're doing. And I think uh, it's fair to say that uh, we hope to partner with our Oregon on various things in the future mm -hmm. too. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, yeah, uh, great organization. I I worked with them on on the '97 campaign. I've worked with them on other other previous campaigns. Um, uh, so I'm sure we'll run our paths uh, cr across each other uh, yes. uh, on on those things too. So you you mentioned uh, Representative Julie uh, Parrish. Julia was it Julie? Julie. Julie, Julie Parrish, a Republican from Westland, and she has filed an initiative regarding health care. Yes. Can you talk about? Can you talk about what happened in the legislature with regard to health care, and uh, with and regarding what her initiative is? Um, I think re what Representative Parrish did was probably in response to the failure on a national level to, at least thus far, to yeah. gut the Affordable Care Act. Mm -hmm. um, and this has to do mostly with Medicaid. Um, as part of the Affordable Care Act, there was an expansion of the Medicaid program. And all told, some 15 million people were added to the program nationwide by those states who were willing to accept the expansion. Unfortunately, yeah. there were a number of states who were unwilling because they had Republican governors who wanted mm -hmm. nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. 
So um, Oregon was one of the states that expanded the most. Um, we added somewhere around 400,000 people to the Medicaid rolls here. So much so that one quarter of the state's population is now on Medicaid. Wow. Representative mm -hmm. Parrish's bill would remove up to 350,000 of those folks from Medicaid. These are folks that never had medical coverage before. Yep. Mm -hmm. I am personally very angry at Representative Parrish for submitting this bill. I think it's very cruel. Yep. And so I will be working with various organizations to defeat this bill. And so I think will our Oregon. Mm -hmm. so yeah, yeah. So I, I, I will say it, it's not a bill. Actually, what the, uh, so. oh, right, the, uh, it's a referral. The, it's a referral. Yeah, the, the uh, Oregon legislature passed the bill. Yes. And now she's referring it to the ballot, hoping the, yes. to defeat it. Yes, I suppose right. that she's hoping that since Measure 97 went down mm -hmm. as a ballot initiative, they'll again be successful in doing something like uh, Yes, this. right, yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, there, there should be uh, at least 400,000 votes out there, all those Medicare, Medicaid uh, recipients should be voting against Getting out the vote on this one, <laughs> presumably be for the November 2018 ballot, mm -hmm. will be very important. Right, right, yeah, right, yeah. So uh, you've, you've, you've made some mention of the Trump administration and, and Congress. Uh, tell us about your general feelings about uh, the president and, and the Republican-led Congress. Donald Trump is the most unfit human being for President of the United States of any president we've had. And we've had a few bad ones. Mm -hmm. But Trump is uh, head and shoulders above or below <laughs> them, <laughs> yeah. depending on how you look at it. Yeah. Um, the administration is trying to kill the federal social safety net in this country. If they succeed in doing so, tens of millions of people will suffer as a result of that. Heaven knows what he's going to do in the area of foreign relations. But he's also aided and abetted by the current incarnation of the Republican Party in this country. And the Republican Party is not what it was when I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. At that oh, point, yeah. mm -hmm. there were people like Jacob Javits. There were people like Senator Edward Brooke. Mm -hmm. Uh, there were people even earlier on, like Fiorello LaGuardia, oh, yeah. who were actually progressives. Mm -hmm. The party has slowly but surely changed, really beginning with the run of Barry Goldwater for president in 1964, yep. and has become what Noam Chomsky has called the most dangerous organization in the world. I don't think Professor Chomsky is exaggerating here. Mm -hmm. I think what the Republican Party stands for now is authoritarianism of the worst kind. It's like they're a conglomerate Ebenezer Scrooge before the three ghosts visited him. Oh. <laughs> yeah, okay, right, yeah, so uh, relatively low opinion. Uh, yes. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, how, how would uh, how would uh, how would you change the structure of of uh, of our national and state political systems to get better results? Well, on the most obvious level, considering the most uh, recent presidential election, I would get rid of the electoral college as fast as possible. Right. Mm -hmm. um, that thing has been around for something like 160 years. It's inherently anti-democratic. Um, it's enabled, uh, the Republicans may like it because it's helped them since 2000, but really, we need, we need the popular vote to be the art stick for how we mm -hmm. elect the president. On a much larger level, our system of government has always struck me as problematic. I prefer the parliamentary systems of government that most European countries have. They differ, it's true, from uh, country to country, but um, I really do believe that a parliamentary system of government is inherently more democratic than what we have now. Unfortunately, our chances of getting it in this country are rather slim yeah. at this point in time. But I think it would be a much more, a much more democratic way of dealing with um, 
uh, national politics and dealing with what kind of legislative body nationally that we, we, we need. Okay, so talk about the major uh, characteristic differences between our system and a parliamentary system. Our system can be gamed much too easily. In a parliamentary system, uh, I think there's much less likelihood of, of that kind of rigging, rigging the game going on. Uh, I think it's very interesting to look what's happening in the United Kingdom now. Mm -hmm. Everybody thought Jeremy Corbyn had no chance and Labor had no chance. But if you, if you put forward a manifesto that really engages people, you will get the votes in elections where there is a parliament and a parliamentary system of government. Labor just may be on the cusp of being dominant again in mm -hmm. the United Kingdom, whereas uh, uh, Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour Party were being counted out only a few short months ago. Mm -hmm. That sort of thing can't be done here because of the way we do our, our presidential elections every four years. Um, it, it doesn't benefit the people in the long run here, mm -hmm. but unfortunately we're stuck with it. Um, for I don't know how many more years. Yeah. So in in England, I, I believe the prime minister, whose name is May, uh, yes, call, uh, called the elections. Yes. Right. And she was not up for election herself. Yes. Uh, but the parliament was. Yes. And she's been excoriated by some other members of the Tory party for doing that. So. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's that, that's a major difference is that. In, in a parliamentary system, the president calls, yes. or the prime minister, call it whichever, yes. uh, calls for election rather than having a regularly scheduled yes. election. Yes. Right, yeah. yeah. And that's a, that's a major difference. Yes. Right, yeah. And, and as, you, as you noted, the, the most recent one, uh, just a few months ago, uh, Labor did quite well, yeah. and the conservative Tories did quite poorly. Yes, right. uh, a great surprise to a number of people. Well, yeah, yes, all right, yeah, because uh, the prime minister really called the election yeah, with the uh, with with the hope of consolidating her her power. Yes, and of course it did just the opposite. You know, Labour's had its trouble too because um, they really adopted neoliberalism with Tony Blair, and mm -hmm. neoliberalism is not a very good thing. Uh, yeah, uh, r right, y yes. And Tony Blair, of course, was, was a labor. Yes, and he's uh, right. still trying to regain power. Uh, yes, uh, right, yeah. And, and, and it's the same like, uh, you know, here, here in the United States, we've got our corporate Democrats and our grassroots Democrats yes. or our left-wing Demo progressive yes. Democrats. And, I and, want a better uh, deal than a better deal. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. So bringing up a better deal, uh, we talked about this before the, uh, before the program, uh, Senator Schumer from New York has proposed something called a better deal. Yes. What, what's that about? It's not enough, basically. There are some incremental changes that are good, but they don't come near to what Senator Bernie Sanders offered up when he was running for president. Mm -hmm. uh, I think what, what Bernie wants is what I want. Um, I'd like even more than what Bernie offered. I, the Labor's manifesto is wonderful but they recommend nationalization for certain industries. Mm -hmm. And even Bernie hasn't gone that far. I think he personally believes in it, but yeah. he knows he can only go so far in this country without bringing a, a house down on him. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but without Bernie, things would be much different now. He did oh, change he the totally game. changed the conversation. He did. Yeah. He oh, did. Wait, yeah. And if he wants to run in the next presidential election, he'll have my vote. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and of course, he built on some other changes that were already happening. Yes. So he probably would not have gotten the platform he did if it hadn't been for Occupy. Yes. Uh, which happened several years before him. Yes. Right. And yeah. a number of yeah. other things, as you point out. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. So it, it, it's my view. That healthcare should be a human right. Mine too. Uh, housing should be a human right. Mine too. Food should be a human right. Mine too. Healthcare, did I say that already? Okay. A anyway, how do we get to actually viewing those 
as human rights in the United States. We have to persevere as a resistance, basically, because that's the mode we're in now. Uh, there's, and there's no choice on that, at least not from my point of view. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know if I'll live to see it, but I really am hoping that someday we become the kind of country we've been talking about and, and that the things that we want will actually come to pass. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing I won't live that long. Um, and I do worry about the future of the country. The authoritarianism that Trump has brought forth is extremely dangerous. And he's enabled right-wing um, extremists who are violent to do things in this country they never would have done before without his urging. Mm -hmm. And he has urged it on. Oh, yeah. That is very scary. And I don't know where that will end. Mm -hmm. Too many people have bought a bill of goods from Donald Trump that is tainted and that is very dangerous. And I don't know where that's going to end, David. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I don't either, but it, it seems, and the most recent one was his, uh, uh, you know, continued attacks on, on leakers and, uh, yes. and the press in general. It's yes. like, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I read that he, and I didn't hear this uh, myself, that he had actually threatened the, to uh, jail journalists. He did. Right. He did. Yeah, which is extremely, extremely scary. Yes. Yeah, right among the many scary things that he does. So, yeah. yeah. Um, talk about the city of Portland. Just, we've got five minutes left, actually four minutes left. Talk about what, what, what policies should the city of Portland be pursuing to make the city a safer place? The police have been a problem in this town for a long time. Keep in mind that the two or three major national police organizations endorsed Donald Trump by margins of 80 to 85 percent. You know what I'd like to know? I'd like to know how many members of the Portland Police Bureau voted for Donald Trump oh. because I fear it's more well over half. Mm. That's what scares me. The deaths of people of color in this town unnecessary. The deaths of people with mental health problems in this town unnecessary because they were killed by the police. Mm -hmm. Something has to be done about that. We had a legal, uh, a legal decision from the U.S. Justice Department, but somehow that seems to have gotten tied up in all sorts of knots. And so that may be the most important thing that has to be resolved here for our community. Um, for the longer view, um, housing is very important to the extent that um, the Portland City Council is responsible for money going to housing. I think Mayor Wheeler is very cognizant of the housing issue, but he's gotten himself into considerable difficulty in regard to the issue of the police. And I don't know how that's going to work out. I can tell you things were a lot simpler for him mm -hmm. when he was chair of the county commission. Oh, yes, right. The county commission does all the human services in the Portland area and within the county. Mm -hmm. And I'm very involved in that in various ways because I benefit from those services. Mm -hmm. um, but the city is very different than the board of county commissioners. The county commissioners work in comparative harmony. In the city, you've got five individual fiefdoms represented on the city council. Mm -hmm. That does not seem to work out all that well. Yeah. Do you think that um, the city would run better if we had uh, election of the commissioners by district? I am not sure about that. The truth is I haven't looked into it. And, compare, you know, and, and done comparisons in other major American cities. So I don't know for certain, but I'm guessing something has to be done to change that. Mm -hmm. Do you think that um, the city council and the city would work better if the 
city commissioners were not in charge of bureaus and they were just a policy making body? Perhaps. I know nobody's in charge of bureaus at the Board of County Commissioners and they <laughs> yeah, yeah. don't do bureaus there. There are divisions uh, or departments within county government. Mm -hmm. uh, but nobody is in charge of a department at, yeah. at, at um, the, the Board of County Commissioners. So I think one group, the Board of County Commissioners, is working very effectively and working in reasonable harmony. But the Portland City Council needs change. Yeah. Uh, some, of what, some of what we've been talking about is probably what's necessary. But I know much more about the county because oh, I've been yeah. working oh, in the right. county yeah. for 20 oh, years right. than, I work, yeah. than I know about right. the city. Yeah. All right. Well, our time has uh, evaporated already. So thank you very much for thank being Thank you here. very much for having me on the yeah. show. Great. Good. Well, look forward to, to come back again. Okay. Great. Good. So, we've been talking with Steve Weiss president of the Oregon Consumer League, as well as a number of other organizations. And I will point out that Steve was not speaking here on this program as the president of the Oregon Consumer League. I, that's just for identification purposes, uh, as well as a number of other organizations. The best way for you to connect with what the Oregon Consumer League is doing and being a part of that is via their Facebook page, www.facebook.com slash OR Consumer League. NAFTA. Don't forget that soon the President's men will start the renegotiations of NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. They have set a very aggressive timeline for concluding the talks by the end of the year. So the President, our U.S. Senators, and U.S. Representatives need to hear from the people as to what we expect to result. What we don't need is a simple insertion of clauses from the Trans-Pacific Partnership into the NAFTA agreement. What we do need instead is elimination of the investor state dispute settlement provisions which have undermined democratic decision making in the past. We need stronger enforceable labor, environmental and public health standards in the agreement itself and we need to be able to have important by American and by local procurement uh, pr uh, preferences. Without these we don't need a renegotiated NAFTA. To learn more, go to the Portland Alliance for Democracy website at afd-pdx.org. Thank you for watching. We'll see you again next week.